I met a listener yesterday. You did what? Yeah, I met I met a listener in person. Someone that wasn't friend or family? Um no. <laughs> no, of course. But uh but I hadn't talked to them about the podcast in person yeah. in a while. They showed up to my son's high school graduation party. Yeah, yeah. This person revealed to me their previously uh, held identity. So, Tom, Darth Vader is a proud listener of the Two Bit Geeks podcast, and I met him in person. Are you making up stories again? So you threw in my face about how amazing it was to sit behind John Malkovich for seven hours on a plane. Yeah. So, you know, I got to bring my own celebrity thing. No, this is a true story. So Darth Vader, as it turns out, is Welsh. David Prowse, right? Well, no, this is a... Di- well, so I don't know. So, you know, Darth Vader has had different manifestations. I mean, he, uh, you, you look at the Darth Vader, you know, of the movies and such, and uh, you got David <laughs> Prowse as the voice. You, uh, you got, no, David Prowse is the actor, James Earl Jones. Right. Is the voice, right? But then, you know, Darth Vader continues to be in these movies. He's really he's reincarnating all over the place, isn't he? This is not some uh, mall Darth Vader, is it, that just hangs out at the uh, local used car <laughs> lot and waves at passersby? <laughs> no, but that does sound like a fun summer job. <laughs> no, so so this this Darth, Darth Vader uh, was a an art student in Wales in the mid-'80s when Return of the Jedi was coming out. And they needed someone to play the part of Darth Vader for the uh, movie openings and other um, appearances and such. And being the tall, spontaneous lad that he was, he was chosen to Darth So for like over a year, he toured the world uh, and during the opening of Return of the Jedi and was Darth Vader. <laughs> and he listens to the podcast. How fantastic is that? <laughs> the Empire is on our side, right? Now I feel bad for belittling his uh, his achievement. Yes, yeah, you're gonna have to cut that out, man. Because <laughs> he's an artist today, and he listens to the podcast and uh, is soothed by your dulcet tones into his creative inspiration. So, well, we thank him for listening. Yeah, yeah. He said it was a lot of fun. He got to do that for like a year. Be Darth Vader. He said kids would like get really upset at him at you know malls and toy stores and such because they're promoting like the the Lucasfilm brand and all that. Yep. He said one time someone, someone threw a pork pie in his face. Uh, <laughs> a, a little kid like rushed the crowd and tried to stick a pin in his side. So he picked him up like uh, Vader does with the, uh, the rebels at the very beginning of uh, New Hope, you know, and pinned him against the wall. Now, this was an official Lucasfilm sanctioned appearance by him? Oh, yeah. He, w- he was Darth Vader at the London opening of Return of the Jedi. So he's not some unlicensed... Darp Nader character. No, or something. no. This okay. is not some two bit Vader. This is the Darth Vader. Like he had the he had like the whole suit with like the blinking lights. He said the helmet was like this this like two part thing. He had a little tape recorder for the uh <laughs> noise, you know? He was like the whole thing. He's like he's like it was totally cool. Like they would like open up a mall and like they would start playing the da 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 and he would come in and they'd have like a little smoke machine and like the kids would all go like oh well, that, that's that's cool, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, you know, if if we're gonna tip our hand, Rebel Alliance or Empire, right now, I'm thinking our two big geeks alliance should go with the Empire. <laughs> have you seen that uh, that subreddit called uh, the Empire Did Nothing Wrong? No, although I've I've heard the theory basically that the uh, the rebels were essentially you know disruptive terrorists and weren't working within the system and needed yeah. to be put down. Yep. Is that essentially the, uh, the take on the rebels? <laughs> I haven't delved too deep into it. I'm a, I, I'm a rebel. You're, you're a rebel? <laughs> Can't you tell? Dude, you're like the opposite of rebel. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that was cool. It's cool to bump into Vader and the Welshies. Yeah, yeah. Have you, have you ever been to Wales? I have been to Wales, yeah. And so you, so you are a noted lover of all things UK. Mm-hmm. So, where would, so if you had to rank order... You know, say there were like meteorites hurtling towards the UK, which which of the constituents of the UK would you, how would you rank order them? We've, we've done, we've rank order the Star Wars movies. So how would you, we're talking Wales, Northern Ireland, England, and uh, Scotland. What's your favorite? <laughs> I don't have a favorite. You don't have a favorite? I, I haven't been to Scotland. Okay. So I, I haven't, I don't have a objective opinion about Scotland. 
But I, I've, I've been to England, I've been to Northern Ireland, I've been to Wales, and uh, they're all very nice. Yeah? Yes. All right. Well, well you're, you're a hill walker. Which one has the best hills to walk? Which has the best hiking? Uh, I haven't done any hiking in Northern Ireland or Wales. Wales has lots of mountains, but I haven't done any hiking there. I've done uh, hiking in England. All right. So I, I guess I have to put that at the top then. Okay. A few, a few years ago, um, I did the, the Ridgeway. Which is a long, long distance trail in, in southern southern England. It goes about ninety miles. Beautiful, beautiful countryside. So I recommend the Ridgeway. That. The Ridgeway. It's the, what part of the oldest road in Britain? That's cool. We have. I have such a a two dimensional, superficial understanding of a lot of these countries. Like when I think <laughs> when I think Scotland, I think of that terrible. Um, well, maybe not terrible. I think of that movie uh, with that conservative actor about Scottish independence. I'm blanking on. What? You know that that movie, dude. Oh, Braveheart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm imagining Scotland. Scotland is a bit more than just that. <laughs> Sometimes I don't even know how to react to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I just realize how much how many gaps there are in my objective understanding of various things in the world, and so I say, oh, if I like had to give up, if I had to stand up and give a you know, a 10 minute presentation on Scotland, for example, to like to, you know, alien visitors who would knew nothing about the earth. What would I talk about? I think after about 20 seconds, I might start talking about Braveheart. You're so cosmopolitan. Yes, absolutely. Well, not really. No. Trying. Trying. Yeah. Gaps in your knowledge are, are, are a good thing because then you get to fill them. As long as you recognize that they're there. <laughs> yeah. So something I wanted to ask you today, hmm. especially since you're now on your local school committee. Yes. What do you think about cursive writing being taught in schools these days? <laughs> Interesting. So I'm certainly not an expert. And if, if I was asked as a school committee member whether we should or should continue to, I would want to defer to what the boots on the ground are observing, right? And I'd, I'd want to talk to the teachers and, and principals and such. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, learning is about one, exposure, and then two, absorption into the growing mind, right? And so there's different ways that you can expose something to, to a, a learning mind such mm -hmm. that it, it's more or less effective for it to absorb. And then there's different ways for, to re reinforce the, the, the learning of that. So I've, I've been told that writing things out and, and expressing your knowledge through, you know, the physical act of writing is, is a strong reinforcer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can see simply for that reason to do that. As far as cursive, you know, but we do have printing and we have cursive. So really the only, because of the digital world, the only practical demand there is for cursive is when you sign your name. Mm -hmm. I actually, I don't actually don't use cursive at all. Could you still write in cursive if you, uh, if you wanted to? Yes. Okay. Although, although it, it, it was never that legible. Part, partly because I'm left-handed. Yeah. And uh, back in the day, for some reason, when you were left-handed, it used to be like you were looked at like you had some disability. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, they used to give you the special scissors and, you know, the special... <laughs> I was like, come on, man. Like, the special, like, little grabby thing to hold the pencil. And so, like, I'm holding a pencil right now just to remind myself. And what you're supposed to do is have your middle finger, your pointer finger, and your thumb all at the very end of the of the pencil or the pen. Yeah. So w what I do though, is I have a bad habit where I have my thumb all the way up at the top. And so it's really just the bottom two fingers. So as a result, it's one, not legible and I can't sustain the stamina. And I could, yeah. I could correct it if I wanted. In fact, when my kids were first learning how to write, they were all excited and they wanted to correct me. And so I, I tried for a few days. This was, you know, <laughs> years ago when they were in like third, fourth grade, uh, but it didn't stick. Hey, your kids have learned cursive? Uh, that's a good question. Oh my gosh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> By way of explanation, um, we're kind of the same age and we, when we grew up, we both learned cursive in grammar school, I assume, right? Yes. Yes. But uh, it's my understanding that now most school districts are not teaching cursive to the kids going through the school systems these days. Is that correct? Uh, you know what? You're putting me on the spot here, Tom. With my... <laughs> I don't believe it. I don't believe it's, it's included in the, you know, the common core curriculum, is it? So common core... Oh, now you're going to tangent me big time, Tom. <laughs> uh oh. We, okay, pause there. Remember where we were coming from because I'm about yep. to jump off. So that's actually 
an incorrect phrase, Common Core Curriculum. Okay. So Common Core is a set of standards. Standards. That's what I meant. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, there's a, but there's a big, big difference. And this is, this is, this is the core of the misunderstanding of Common Core, which is, so Common Core says, you know, by this grade, you ought to be able to do this. So it's, it's the, it defines the goal by, by grade level. It doesn't define how you get there. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the curriculum is, okay, this is how we're going to teach this um, concept in math in order to achieve those goals. And so, so people will post critical things of, oh, look at this common core math. Isn't this really terrible how they are teaching math? And this is just one company's way that they're selling to school districts in order to achieve that goal. It says, so there is no imposition by the government or the state or any other in terms of like you have to learn in this method. You know, depending on what your state and local law is, you know, that's, that's up to the state and municipalities. But, but there was, you know, I, I think the common, common core is a bigger topic, but it got a lot of unfair criticism for the fact that it was like a curriculum and it was the Nash, the federal government telling the states and the, and the cities and towns what to do. And therefore it being a power grab when, when really the, the, the goal of it was to say all public schools ought to be held to these higher standards and therefore require the federal and the state governments to, to fund schools to, in order so they can achieve those standards, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yep. And yet, so therefore, you know, the, so political powers that don't like funding of public schools turned it on its head and said, oh, the big bad federal government is coming and telling you what to do. You know, as, as, as politicians often do, it, it got people who really need government funded money for public services to say no to government funded money for public service <laughs> unfortunately right so circling back around to cursive yes. um do you know if your your local school district teaches uh, still teaches cursive writing to students so i don't think that they do yeah but if i am wrong i'll have you edit my answer out yeah <laughs> <laughs> but the thinking the thinking is that it, it, it's it's no longer required it's no longer a necessary skill for people growing up is what they're, what they're telling us, I guess, is that with the ubiquitous of digital devices and computers and stuff like that, who, yeah. who has, who has the need to, to write in cursive, I guess, is the uh, justification for cutting it from school curriculums. Yeah. It's a legitimate observation. It makes me a little sad, to be honest. It, it does make me sad too. Um, so, you know, schools have intense amount of pressure to get all students skilled up in a, a various number of things. And so particularly when you're in an environment where you, where schools are, are more and more being held to like, you know, standardized tests, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, by, by various states or national level, then with your limited amount of time and resources, you have to teach to the skills that you're going to be tested on. So things that could have great value get left by the way, wayside. This is a huge debate yeah. in education today. On the one hand, you want students to have basic skills. On the other hand, there are, Things that are wonderful and incredibly valuable about educating a growing mind, like the arts and history and in handwriting, you know, and all these other things, music that you can't put on one standard academic test. You know, therefore, if if you are going to value those things, then you're kind of on your own in terms of you know finding the time and and uh, funding for it. There's yeah, there's I'm so as a result, there's even a de-emphasis on on the on printing and you know, the printed word oh, no. being able to like, you know, block letter print. And it's, it, I mean, it's, you can sort of tail this back even further if you wanted to uh, about the technological age beyond the, the school uh, classroom. You know, I mean, I've seen, I've seen teenagers who aren't able to tie their shoes because, because you have shoes that have, you know, Velcro and other, right, other right, ways right. to assemble. So, you know, basic kind of, or, or ride a bike because they're not, they're not in a, you know, environment where they even ha they either have a bike or they're able to, that does, that's a common activity, you know, that their peers do. Yeah, and yeah. so it's less likely to, to be able to engage in that. So it's, it's, it's funny because, okay, do you really need to ride a bike if, if you don't have to use it for transportation? Do you really need to write mm. in print if you can type? Do you really need these various things? It's kind of, and it's, to me, it sort of raises this philosophical question for just for your own personal edification or for learning in general. What is the value of a skill that does not have a directed purpose? Yeah, I mean, like yourself, I, I, I have no real daily need for cursive writing anymore. And my skill has withered on the vine because of that. And I, lately, I've been kind of feeling bad about that. Because hmm. 
that the next generation is not even learning it at all, and our generation is losing it as a skill, it's going to be extinct before we know it. Uh, and another thing that didn't occur to me at first is that when people don't learn how to write cursive, they can't read that style of writing either. <laughs> That's true. Right. I mean, and we're going to get to a point in this country where the majority of the people can't even read the founding documents of our country, like the Declaration of Independence, which is written in cursive writing. Right. We're, we'll be all dependent on computer transcriptions. Although, so, so certainly evolution of technology is accelerating this change. But I mean, you go back and read English from like the Shakespeare era, and it's, it's, it's initially hard to decipher and access, mm -hmm. even though it's the same. I mean, language is always... Language and forms of communication are always evolving, right? So, so to what I, I, when these things sort of change, especially now that I'm middle age, you know, we, we're sort of in a unique place in that we we can sort of look at both sides of the uh, the teeter totter. You know, you can imagine being a an, an old curmudgeonly back in my day. You know, we used to do this, and we would just let our kids outside, and they yeah, would run around yeah. and play, and everything was wonderful. And we didn't have these playstations and these techno yeah. gadgets. You know, on the other hand, you see, you, you can you can imagine, you know, kids just evolving and changing and adapting to to different things. And if if they're losing something like cursive, right? But they are much more naturally aware of, say, environmental change and all that. You know, is that necessarily a bad thing? So I don't, I don't know. I, 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 how much am I attached to the particular forms of my era versus what is, you yeah. know, good for society? I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be inevitable, but it still, it makes me sad. And I've been feeling lately that I, I'd like to try to recapture some of that skill that I lost and develop my ability to write in cursive again. Do you remember diagramming sentences? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's also a, a dying art. Really? Absolutely. Isn't that just t like teaching grammar? Yes, but when you are formulating a standardized test at the state level that is then going to determine accountability and national funding, <laughs> are you going to put <laughs> sentence diagramming on that? Uh, These are the forces that are at work. What else are we losing? <laughs> they, right. Do they even do mathematics anymore? <laughs> All the time, you have a calculator. <laughs> I, I know, right? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> well, this is you, you're gonna get me started now. I mean, it's it's not a. It, I mean, it, yeah. On one hand, it's an absurd question, but it, people have always asked this question. You know, like, when am I ever gonna use algebra? I mean, so circling back to what a you know, earlier question, what's the purpose of a potentially purposeless skill? Well, I the the purpose of a the purpose of algebra is to exercise your brain. It's like it's like running. Running has no purpose unless you're going to a destination. Right. So I think that's one good way to get at it. So I think things that don't have an immediately functional occupational application still can have immense value because it's evolving and maturing your, your brain and your mind. Mm -hmm. So for example, yeah. we're talking about history, right? And social studies. This is another top uh, area in not just in elementary school, but in you know high schools as well. That is is under a lot of pressure because it's it's hard to get it's hard to justify a standardized test at the you know state and national level for something like social studies and then it gets very political right in terms of what you're yeah, yeah. what you're teaching and how you're teaching it and yet you know we're we're fortunate in in my town that we st we still have a great value for it because it teaches critical thinking mm -hmm. it teaches I mean a lot of the themes we've talked about before right about you approach some particular topic. And some historical moment in which there were forces opposing each other. And you talk about how that happened, how it was interpreted, how we now think about that. And you're, you're not doing it in order to remember that, oh, this event happened in, you know, 1857 or whatever. You're, you're doing it to understand the dynamic. And right, right. by virtue of that, grow a, a mind that is able to think critically and evaluate information on its own. You know, therefore, you, you could sort of extrapolate from that, well, what's the high level principle that we are valuing in education? It's the evolving an open, critical, evaluative mind, mm. right? It's not just a, schools are not just preprocessors for the workplace, <laughs> right? Not just to get you on uh, 18 years and then we put you on the day shift. It's, it's we're trying, you're trying to become a, a human being in the world and grappling with the fact that you have this mind and how do you, how do you do that? And so you, so, right, so then people have great value and benefit for for the arts and for uh, and for cultural diversity. 
But the problem, though, is, and this is why public education is such a great experiment, is that people have such different viewpoints about where that ought to be prioritized in, in public education, right? And so if, you, if everybody has to agree on it, right, in the <laughs> public education sphere, what do you boil that down? What's the lowest common denominator? And then do you really want to be investing in something that is only the lowest common denominator? So, Are, are kids even learning about denominators anymore? <laughs> <laughs> right. So I feel bad that I don't, I don't use cursive anymore. Should I feel bad? I don't, I don't, I mean, cursive specifically? Yeah, I mean, like my mother right. grew up in the 1940s and she can still to this day write in perfect Palmer Method script, you know? Yeah. It's, just, it's just so beautiful to look at yeah. that I, I wish I could do that. I, I think, so, I mean, maybe for you it's cursive. Maybe for you it's, it's some other skill. Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think you have to have every skill that might fall by the wayside. But, yeah. but, but it, is, it is cool to have, I mean, because, dude, once you die, you're not going to be writing in cursive anymore. <laughs> right? So, I mean, okay, so you put all this time and investment into cursive. It's like, okay, great. For how, how many years? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I just don't want, I just don't want it to, I just don't want it to die. Maybe as a great stroke of irony, you should not learn cursive, but you should dedicate your life to the preservation of writing cursive. Right? And so you could have like, you know, fundraisers and, you know, public advocacy organizations. And, you know, talk to school committee members about getting <laughs> cursive back in there. You could yeah. be like wearing your tuxedo and having a glass of wine and, and uh, giving a, a benefactor speech. And then like when you write out the agenda, it would all be in print. That would be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that, that, you know, that reminds me of something else I've wanted to learn. This might seem odd to you. Or maybe, it w maybe it won't. But I also want to learn cuneiform. Really? Another dead writing style. Yeah. Sumerian. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a... Uh, Writing style that can either be in Sumerian or Akkadian, the okay. two ancient dead languages. But uh, Akkadian, I'd never heard of that one. Yeah, Akkad. It's one of the old Mesopotamian uh, kingdoms. It's something that, something I found out recently is a book I've been reading lately called uh, "The Buried Book," which is about uh, the discovery and recovery of uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, mm -hmm. which is the uh, oldest piece of literature in human civilization that's still surviving. It's written down in cuneiform. Beautifully referenced in um, Darmok, by the way. <laughs> but uh, something I didn't realize is that, like in the like the British Museum, they have tens of thousands of clay tablets written in cuneiform from ancient Sumeria and, and Akkad that are recovered from like the, uh, the the library of Ashurbanipal. There's thousands and thousands of these clay tablets. Most of them have never been transcribed or translated. Really. Because the the skill to read cuneiform is so specialized that there aren't enough people to process all those clay tablets and and translate them. That seems very uh, non believable. Like, <laughs> so you're telling I know. me? I mean, th th within those clay tablets they, they dug out of the ancient library, they 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 recovered the Epic of Gilgamesh. You know, the oldest piece of literature in human civilization. But uh, there could there could be other things in there too that we just haven't found because just no one has the skill to read it. You telling me you can't define the grammatical rules of cuneiform, load it into a program, scan the tablets, and have it get translated? I don't I don't understand that. Well, hey, I don't get what the problem is. Maybe, maybe that's something we can work on, but. Uh, Apparently there's, there's tens of thousands of untranslated clay tablets from thousands and thousands of years ago that are just sitting there waiting to be read for the first time in thousands of years. Uh, and dude, cursive writing is going to become the same thing. Right. If we, if we, if we let it die out. Dude, maybe the same galaxy hopping civilization that warned us about the planet eating monster from Tabby Star also dropped us a cuneiform tablet that we just haven't gotten around to translating yet. <laughs> exactly. That would be unfortunate. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. I have too much of a demand for my functional attention at this phase in my existence to be devoting too much attention to purposeless pursuits. <laughs> oh, purposeless pursuits are the best. <laughs> I know, but like... My whole life is centered around purposeless pursuits. Well, life itself is uh, philosophically a purposeless pursuit, uh, if you define it as so, yeah? Yeah, in the long run it is, certainly. Do you have any purposeless pursuits? Well, it depends on your evaluation of the purpose, I guess. I mean, meditation might be a purposeless pursuit. That's true. I'm sure a lot of people would find no purpose in that. Podcasting is probably a purposeless <laughs> pursuit too. Uh, that's well, but but is it though? 
I mean, we're not doing this for no reason, right? Is that is that the same thing? Are we saying the same thing? Is purposeless meaning for no reason? Wouldn't it be insane to do something for no reason? I, I don't think there is such a such a thing as a truly purposeless pursuit. I think all pursuits are have purpose to at least to someone. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a pursuit. It would just be it would be something else. A pursuit implies that it has some sort of interest to somebody. Are are we are we splitting the atom here between so say cursive right say like I spent all this time to learn cursive, and I really enjoyed the process of learning cursive and it was satisfying for me to write cursive and yet I didn't actually use it for anything would that be a case in which the, the it was the journey not the destination you know it was the means yeah, yeah, yeah. that I enjoyed and yet it did not have any particular practical end yeah I think to an outside observer it would appear purposeless but I think anything that that you do that enriches your your life even if no one else enjoys it is, is has purpose because it's uh, because it's it's worthwhile to have an enriched life. It's worthwhile to it's worthwhile to exercise your brain. It's worthwhile to is that the goal is the goal of your life to exercise your brain? It's the goal of my life. <laughs> okay. Well, that's an interesting island to land upon. So you would you say the goal? Of, so the goal of your life is to exercise your brain. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that. Huh. I consider myself a lifelong learner. That's the thing that I'm, I think that's most, you know, passionate about in my right. life is just learning new things all the time, every day. Mm. Keep going, keep going, keep going. There's, there's no, there's no end to things you can learn. Do you, do you split it between learning something more in depth versus learning new things? Like say you like learned piano, right? And after yeah. a few weeks you can play heart and soul and, you know, a couple of Grateful Dead tunes. Do you, do you find the same level of drive to learn that more deeply or no, you're like or you're like oh i, I want to start like baking tiger lilies like <laughs> i would describe my knowledge as basically wide but shallow <laughs> <laughs> okay well i mean do you do you enjoy that yeah i do i, I don't go i don't typically go deep very deep in a small number of subjects i, I like to learn a little bit about everything hmm. do you think you're missing something by not going really deep in like one thing i sure i probably am it's just that's not what interests me. Huh. Uh, there's always something else that's taking my attention away. Right. When, when you're on your deathbed, are you still going to be like, ooh, I want to learn cuneiform? I hope so. Or do you have like kind of like you're trying to tick off a certain number of things, at which point, you know, at some point you'll like, if you last long enough, you'll like, you'll be at peace with the number of things you've learned. And then you're like, all right, cool. No, no, I don't think I'll ever be satisfied. There's always something new you can learn. Hmm. That's probably good for your... um. Your mental, uh, just in terms of avoiding senility, Tom, it's probably good for your, uh, for your mental hygiene. Oh, I hope so. There's a lot of good research and exercise that essentially talks about, you know, your, your mind as this neural net and w what is it that, that constitutes a long-term healthy state of that. And if you are continually running over the same neural paths, the same patterns, and you're not constantly actively expanding that configuration of neurons, then you are increasing the likelihood of physical sedentariness setting in and atrophy and, you know, mm. uh, yeah, I like that, you know, mental plaque, et cetera. And so it, and, and so it's, it's not just satisfying and fun, but it's, it's to your physical self-interest to want to continue to, to expand that. Yeah, so having wide interests is is good for you. Yeah, yeah, I'll buy that. I'd like to. Th I'd like to believe that. Sure. Hmm. I was. I was. More, I was um, interested that you hit this. You know, that you, the goal of your life is to. Uh, how did you put it? Exercise your mind. Exercise your brain. Yeah. Exercise your brain. Is that above all other goals? Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, what? What? I mean, I'm not someone that's motivated by material success or right or fame or or i'm not motivated by my professional career so much other than the podcast yeah <laughs> that's not my professional <laughs> career. but uh if, if there was something that was incredibly uh, had incredible potential to exercise your mind and yet was really unpleasant really uncomfortable for you you would be motivated to do it in other words pleasure and comfort is a lesser priority for you than mind exercising 
Do you have an example of something like something like that? I, uh, I don't. Well, let me see. Let me try to think of something. Like, uh, I can't think of any. I can't think of something that I, I put in, you know my interest into that's unpleasurable. Well, well, okay. Well, that's a good question. Then is I I I, I don't think that necessarily what exercises your mind is essentially. Like you go to some incredibly difficult class, right? So you took some class at community college in um, yeah. higher level calculus, some yeah. lower, some level of math that's currently beyond you, right? Yeah. And it was really challenging. And the teacher was a real schnooker about homework. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you really had to push yourself and it, you didn't have the time for it. And maybe your classmates weren't, you know, uh, entirely nice. And uh, it was a, you know, terrible commute to get there. You know, on the surface, those experiences are not pleasurable, but you are totally exercising your mind to a very high degree. Yeah. That would be different than, that would be different than like, oh, I want to do a crossword puzzle on the train ride home. Yeah. I think I can segregate in my mind learning from the actual process that a lot of people go through to learn. I mean, I don't need, I don't, well, I don't want to go to a class to learn something. Mm. I just want to learn something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I could do it without writing all the papers and, you know, doing the, uh, the book reports and all that. Mm. I guess part of what I'm thinking about, and this sort of relates to your wide, but not deep, is that yeah. I, I definitely have a experience where when I learn something, it's, it's really exciting and engaging at first because it's all new. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you, you sort, I'm sort of pulled along and motivated by to learn it by that novelty and that freshness but then then there comes a point where it it demands more effort and sustained discipline and attention if i'm going to get to the next level and if i do get to the next level particularly for skill based things it's much yeah. more satisfying and it gets a deeper level of experience but but it it's a higher bar it's kind of like at each you know level of the temple of shaolin it like asks a higher that's more of you in order to have that, that broader experience. So like, you know, yeah. I know the basics of ultimate Frisbee, right. But I'm, I'm, I'm not talented or, and I certainly still don't like understand the flow of the game to even to the degree that like, you know, high school <laughs> athletes do. And so I could put my time and attention into that to have that greater experience, but that's going to require that level of effort. It's kind of like, yeah. you know, the athlete that is running up the hill at the end of practice even though it's, you know, incredibly unpleasurable at the moment, it's part of a greater goal that you're putting the sustained effort into that is ultimately more rewarding. Yeah, I, I always just move on to the next subject before, <laughs> I, before I achieve the next level of anything. I don't think I can be a world-class athlete, scientist, or mathematician, or philosopher, or anything. Yeah. It's, but by the time I get to so far into it, I've, I've something else shiny is attracted my attention. <laughs> You're you're a fish that is enticed by the uh, by the bobble in the water. Yeah, so I'll probably uh, learn a little cuneiform, but not enough to decipher all the the remaining clay tablets. Ah, so close, but yet so far from avoiding yeah. the planet eating monster. Thanks, humanity. Thanks you for your service, Tom. Yeah, <laughs> I I still um uh, have have great plans to to increase my base level self discipline so that I can apply it to to skills like that. Not not for like cuneiform, mm -hmm. but for like the things that are like really important to me for like, like I just, I mean, I've talked about this endlessly, but you know, self-discipline in the morning, meditation, all that. Yeah. I, I, I hate that I've been meditating for 25 years now, 23 years. And, uh, and my self-discipline is still where it's at, right? So. Yeah. I still have a long list of things I still want to learn. I haven't even touched yet. Mm. Keep, keep me busy for years. There you go. Tom's purpose in life achieved or defined. <laughs> defined, not achieved. <laughs> right. I, I, will never, I will never achieve it. Right. That's sad. It's the journey. Huh. Death. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just talked about life. So, you know, death is certainly on my mind. So like when you're in, I guess, do you, do you worry about having regrets on your deathbed? No, I don't. You don't? No. Hmm. I worry about it a lot. No, well, that's, there's this, this more important things to worry about. Well, there's probably more important things to be paying attention to other than worry. Yes. That's probably a more accurate way to put that, eh? Yeah. Do you, do you, do you hope that you die before you get like all really sick? Oh. 
You know those last like years where you're like you're hanging on and everything's breaking down. You looking forward to that? I, I think I'm gonna I, I'm gonna have to put together a little veto list of subjects I I don't want to go into <laughs> with you. Politics is one, and death is gonna be another one. Dude, really? <laughs> oh, I'm gonna have to circle around that and death. You don't want to talk about death? No, I I could talk about death for hours. Uh, I know. <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna have to fork this podcast, and you can have your own little <laughs> death special. Maybe okay. Maybe not death. Maybe just um, hmm, misery, destruction, existentialism. I don't know. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about squeaky cats or oatmeal? Squeaky cats or oatmeal? Now that's a that's quite a choice you're giving me. <laughs> I can't. I'm not creative enough at this hour of the day to combine them. <laughs> yeah, you can have to work on that. Um, I think I have an idea of what you... I'm going to go with squeaky cats. Okay. Squeaky cats for 100, Alex. Okay. And so this is, this is then going to in- involve sending you a link. Bring it. Okay. I just sent you a... Um, so I know that you're not big into the Facebook, but this was a page that I started following, which is probably the favorite page I've followed in many years. Uh, And this is, it's called Rare and Strange Instruments. It's the name of the Facebook page, and they show Rare and Strange Instruments. So this is an example of uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow played on a cat organ. You know those little cats that you push down and they go, you know, they they squeak? Yep. Yep. So he's got them all lined up, and he's playing... Which I thought was just <laughs> beautiful. The guy looks a little eccentric too, you know. So it's like, yeah, that is the kind of guy who would scour the face of the earth, getting oh dear. you know uh, cats and putting them in an order of of uh, of tone, and then being able to do something like that. Oh dear! Very impressive. So this is just one example of uh, of things. You know, so if you're looking, I know you. You know, you you said you had trouble finding you know good important content to follow on Facebook. So this is a this is a this is a winner here. Is it? Do you like to switch to oatmeal? <laughs> so are, are we are we supposed to derive any kind of philosophical profundity from this this performance on the squeaky cats? We were talking about um, the purpose of purposeless skill. <laughs> this is purposeless, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's exquisitely beautiful that someone learned how to play a song and have it be... I mean, he's, he's really... You watch his technique, right? He's not just hitting each of these random cats. He's not just proving a concept. He's taking this seriously. Yeah, and you know, he's like putting just the right amount of pressure to get the just the right uh, effect from the... From the sound, he's got the piano accompaniment. He's in this nice musical studio. Like, it's cool. I, th- I think that's that's brilliant. You want to talk about you know extracting purpose? You know, there you go. So I, was, I found that I find that inspiring. Like more than like you know your your random flotsam and jetsam of oh these high school students were mean to this kid and then he became the the prom king and his life is wonderful now. Like I find this much more inspiring. Yep, I I agree. It's good. It, it does have a purpose, even though it's purposeless. It does bring a little bit of whimsy to our lives. You're big on whimsy. I love whimsy. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you tell? <laughs> it is, I mean, it's not the first thing that you would think of, though, if you had, <laughs> if you had met you for just like the first few times, though. Oh, he's so whimsical. You don't emanate whimsiness. No, that's true. And that's probably on purpose. Yeah. Is it? Do you only let people into know your whimsy persona after you like trust them a little bit? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go with yes on that one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you, you probably know me just as well as anyone <laughs> these days. These days. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, I could talk about oatmeal unless you have something else to talk about. No, go for the oatmeal. Um, Serenade us with your oatmeal glory. Yeah. So, so Tom, um, maybe this will show up on our uh, our new Patreon feed soon. Um, as you scour the, the back catalog of what has ended up on the podcast editing room floor. Yeah. But we had a nice little, um, 
back and forth discussion about uh, breakfast at one point. Uh, that for- did we? <laughs> <laughs> so I should we s- did. I should say fifty percent of the participants in Two Bit Geeks thought that we had a nice discussion <laughs> about breakfast the other <laughs> the other month. All right, all right. Uh, you, you're gonna have to remind me. This is this is probably lost the mists of time. Okay. Well, it was special to me anyway. Okay. And yeah, so we, I was asking you what you ate for breakfast and we had gone back and forth a little bit about orange juice and oatmeal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, that's a shame that that got cut up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say that the percent of Tibet geek participants who still think this is an interesting topic has not changed <laughs> given the recent data. That's, that's a, that's, that's a sound estimate. Yes. Um, Continue. But yeah, I was slamming orange juice. I was praising Kool-Aid and then I was waxing poetic about oatmeal. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was trying to squeeze that into our, our discussion because I had a, uh, another wonderful bowl of oatmeal the other day. Yeah. So, um, no, dude, I think oatmeal is pretty fantastic um, because it, it is a delivery mechanism for highly concentrated nutrition at a point in your sleep-wake cycle where you are most likely to be consuming food in an automated fashion. In an automated fashion. What, what, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> How do you normally get your breakfast? I, I don't mean by a mechanic, mechanistic automation. I mean where you are going based on uh, habit and routine. So, for, you know, okay. so if you break up your meals like most humans do and, you know, uh, breakfast, lunch and dinner, etc. The, the one that you're most likely to go on autopilot for in terms of preparation and acquisition Okay. It's breakfast, right? So having oatmeal every day breaks the routine somehow? Well, well if, if you're going to try and eat more healthy, as okay. you know, many people try and do, right? Yeah. If you're going to put some preparation and thought into something, breakfast, I think, is, the, is, is your biggest bang for your buck. Because cause you're, cause more than the other meals, you're, you're most likely just to go by whatever default routine you have going. You're, not, you're rushing around in the morning, you try to get out of the house, right? And so yeah. it's like, yeah. boom. Uh, not to say that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, quote unquote, but um, it has that potential. So how is oatmeal a strike against automation? It's not a strike against automation. It's if you're going to automate something. Oh, you should automate oatmeal. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> then, then do something in the morning. Get into a routine that's going to be beneficial to you, right? If, in other words, if you don't put any thought into what you're going to eat for breakfast and you just grab whatever's available, you're just yeah. leaving yourself to the the influence and the and the resource of of uh, of what you have, as opposed to you know pre planning it. I'm saying if you're going to pre plan something, pre plan breakfast. That's that's my first point. All right, point one, got it. Okay, and then so then oatmeal is great because it. Uh, oh, you know what? I don't know why. Oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> now now I'm feeling a little defensive about my oatmeal. So, um, well, okay. So I'm, I'm going to get these this probably a little wrong, but Tom, I'm going to ask for a little help here. Right. So you, you, I'll do what I can. You expand my health terminology. All right. Cause I'll probably butcher a term or two here. So, okay. so you know how there's simple carbohydrates and complex carbohydrates? Sure. Sure. Okay. I've heard that term okay. before. Okay. Yeah. So like a white piece of wonder bread is your, is your simple carb, right? So a carbohydrate yep. Yep. as a molecular structure kind of and it's and, and white bread is simpler than say whole wheat bread because it is only one part of the the wheat uh, kernel whatever uh, and it does not include so it's like um, so the more complex the carbohydrate the the longer burning the fuel is right 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 and the longer it takes your body to break it down into the ultimately the the glucose that it's going to use in order to you know move your fingers or talk on a podcast or whatever yeah and so so when you're when you're shoveling that fuel into the engine of your body in the morning, you want to consume fuel that's, that's going to last over, over time. So actually a really good question that my daughter asked me years ago is why don't, if it's ultimately all glucose, why don't you just eat a big bag of sugar in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> I like the way she thinks. <laughs> you know, right? It was actually a really good, insightful question. I thought it's like, you know what, that's, that's that, because ultimately that, that is what's happening is that, you know, in order to perf- ultimately perform the acts that your body wants, it's burning sugar. So why not just eat it directly? And the answer is, is that, is that you're overriding your body's, if you, if you were to do that, just put a yeah. teaspoon in a, in, a, in a bag of sugar and just hunker down, you're overriding your body's management of when the sugar output needs to happen from the fuel it has available, right? You, it's, uh, you're, okay. you're jumping right to the end. You're saying, boom, here's some, glu- here's some glucose. 
Now, now maybe maybe that's fine. Maybe like a bear is about to attack you, you know. So you eat a few teaspoons of sugar, and then you're you're off and running, right? But but typically, you want your body to manage that ebb and flow so that there's not some huge unnecessary spike based on the conditions of the moment or some huge crash, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're familiar with like the sugar crash, right? Yeah, I, I had that this morning after I had my big bowl of sugar. <laughs> okay, there you go. So so it's more it's it's so it's more effective to give your body some fuel where it can sort of decide when do I want to burn the the fuel and when do I not. So that that's more so that's just a um a roundabout way of saying it's better to to initiate the energy that your body has with with complex carbohydrates rather than simple carbohydrates. And thus oatmeal. And thus oatmeal, thus thus whole grain oatmeal. Uh, or I should say uh old fashioned oatmeal, right? Cuz the oatmeal comes in different variations where they like will will pre-cook it and so that you so you lose a certain complexity of the carbohydrate. So the the dominant grain in US food is is wheat. Yeah. That's so that and that gets dumped into a lot of other processed foods. So if you're trying to eat a more diverse set of uh set of inputs, then <laughs> I really, it's really sounding very computerish, isn't it? Diverse set of inputs. <laughs> <laughs> then oats are a, a really nice way to to complement that. That don't they don't get as much pub as uh, as 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 wheat does. Plus, I find it really as a vegetarian, I find it really effective to be able to throw lots of like uh, berries and seeds and nuts and stuff in there. Oh gosh, right? <laughs> nuts and twigs, great. <laughs> Well, it's, you know that scene in the Matrix where they're eating uh, on the uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and they're uh, he puts this like slop into a bowl, and it's he's talking about oh well, what, he's, Neo says what is this? It's like oh all twelve essential amino acids and every nutrient, everything a body needs. But don't you want to do a little bit of that, like a little bit of like self conscious engineering of your body's inputs, where you train yourself to eat the most concentrated nutrient thing? Because it's because that's what I tried to do over time is that if yeah like I have like the most what I've personally determined to be the most healthy collection of nuts and seeds and berries <laughs> and I put that in the oatmeal right so it's like I try to make that the most concentrated health boost possible so that whatever else happens over the course of the day you know maybe I eat pizza for dinner or whatever you know go off the rails a little bit it's not as big of a deal if you've already had one really healthy dose in the morning Okay. Does that make any sense? Sure. Yeah, it makes okay. sense. Uh, I, if given the choice between a bowl of oatmeal and a bowl of sugar, <laughs> <laughs> I might have a tough time with that. <laughs> I've successfully advocated for oatmeal over sugar, have I? Well, I don't know. I, I, your daughter makes a pretty compelling case to me. <laughs> hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to help support the podcast, Fubit Geeks is now on Patreon.com. Patrons of the podcast will have access to occasional extra bits and episodes not found in the regular podcast feed. You'll find a link to Patreon in the show notes. We thank you for your support. <laughs>